Welcome back to Corbin AI, where I'm showing you daily how to start leveraging artificial intelligence in your personal and your business life. In today's video, you clicked because I'm going to go over the topic of prompt engineering. More specifically, I'm going to go over where the value lines when it comes to prompt engineering, as I see there's two main value points in the skill set of prompt engineering, and both are entirely different. One has more of intellectual property value and one has more of expediating and productivity value. So let's go ahead and jump in both of these as in today's video, I'm going to use my experience and what I've seen in the industry and kind of give you insight of what prompt. Well, first off, I'll go over what prompt engineering is and then kind of give you insight of where the value even like is found in prompt engineering because I see it thrown around a lot. Oh, new prompt engineering job or prompt engineering, uh, you know, paid XYZ amount. Let me actually tell you the real applicable value of what prompt engineering is in this new digital market. All right, so to start off, let's go ahead and erase that welcome. And essentially the way I'm seeing prompt engineering kind of, you know, flesh out is two main roles. So we got prompt engineering more as a front end UI role. And what I mean by that is a sense of how do you communicate with uh, artificial intelligence, bots, language learning bots, stuff of this nature, like chat GBT, you know, Bard, you know, how do we communicate? You know, you go to chatgbt.com. How are you communicating with chatgbt? This is the first value point, but this value point is more aligned with uh, essentially productivity and your way of leveraging your individual time. There is another layer of prompt engineering, though, that I feel like isn't talked about or isn't really recognized. And that's going to be the intellectual property of prompt engineering. And what do I mean by that? Essentially, what I mean by that is how are prompts structured in code and more specifically code for, you know, whatever your SAS is or whatever the underlying software is um, for, you, you know, the use case. And what I mean by that essentially is ChatGPT is more of, you know, communicating, you know, how do I get to an answer faster? How do I structure my answers with ChatGPT? while the IP, the intellectual property that is being found is more of this sense. So essentially, how am I structuring the prompts inside the underlying code? Now, there's going to be a little bit of discrepancy I want to go over here because it, I actually found it pretty interesting as we're developing SaaS platforms here. Um, there is actually a difference between how you input a chat GBT prompt into this kind of model comparative to the front end UI model and even comparative to using automations platforms like Zapier and using those blocks. Every single one of these uh, different platforms, you actually have to communicate with the chat GBT model differently, which I thought was very interesting due to the fact that I'm under the impression that if I choose the model of GBT 3.516K and I communicate on the front end, of GPT, you know, just regular chat of chat GPT and they communicate with Zapier and then I use it in a back end of code. They should all communicate the same or I should be able to use the same prompt unilaterally and essentially have no issues. But here's the thing. There is issues with it. And that's really interesting. So the idea essentially is this. And, you know, this is pretty nuanced. But when you are uh, prompting with chat GPT just regularly, right? So I'm using the front end. I'm communicating with you know just the chat bot back and forth let's say i have a really good prompt that allows me to you know create an article let's say you know i have very specific prompt layout maybe it takes me two different proctors to create said article and every time that output comes out for that article i am satisfied with the quality of it and i can kind of proceed from there what is interesting and what we have found here is that that exact same prompt structuring that you do over here is not going to be the same over here in order to receive the same quality output um, that is found with this chat GPT output when you're actually accessing the API open AI um, and you're using it in code the the structuring of the underlying prompt is is a lot different uh, more in the sense that I found that the structuring of the prompts when using the open AI directly is more direct and not only that it's more um, you have to include words that you wouldn't otherwise need to include here it's less uh, it's less forgiving essentially. So you have to include, there's more context you have to provide over here. Furthermore, let's say the thought process is in order to achieve this perfect article in the front end UI, it requires three different prompt structurings. This is going to require either more or even more effective prompts because of the fact that in this context over here, unless you build out something really advanced over here, you have pre-contextual uh, outputs in order to understand the, the further output. Now it's possible over here as well, it just requires a lot more backend work and therefore the directive of essentially working in the front end UI, the goal is, um, the goal in front end UI is I could 
you know, talk to it 10 different times or send in 10 different prompts that I pre-structured and I get my output every single time. That's fine. But over here, you don't want to use 10 different prompts in order to get that output. It's going to be very cost effective, but also more prone to error because we're using uh, the API more directly. Now, here's another thing that I figured out which is really interesting. I thought this was, I was honestly kind of confused at first. So this just tells me when dealing with Zapier and automation platforms, they must do some type of, um, there must be some type of prompts or some type of code that we're not being aware of. So when we provide that chat GPT box, you know, it says conversation and you input your prompt where it says user message, there must be some type of contextual information that we don't see on the front end of the UI because of this. What I realized is that using Zapier's uh, chat GPT block, right? So we have the chat GPT block and we input our user message and then you have your different parameters and so on. This prompt and its relative output is gonna have to be different when you actually code it directly into your, your product using VS code or whatever that nature. So when you actually are coding these prompts and, and actually structuring the prompt here, um, it's actually different from Zapier. So I was always under the impression, and it is of course, where these chat GPT blocks are communicating directly with OpenAI's API. Of course it is, but there's something going on here that we're not aware of that's uh, basically giving you, as I said before, uh, more forgiveness on the way you structure your prompts because essentially um, I can use less words and achieve still really good outputs. What I found is though, when you are coding directly to the API, you have to use more words and you have to be very, very direct on what you exactly want. So what I mean by this essentially is if I am using, let's say in Ch uh, Zapier over here, I'm using like the model 3.5 and then in my code, I'm calling upon 3.5 as well. Essentially, I could give the exact same prompt and put it over here. And it isn't like a slight differentiation in output where it's like, uh, maybe a couple words are different. Maybe the structure is a little bit different. No, no, this is like, two different worlds. So it's like, you know, uh, output A, output B, even though it's the same exact prompt and I'm using the ex same exact model. Interesting, right? So something's obviously going on here and I don't blame them. They actually made on these automation platforms, they probably made it easier where actually they're more forgiving on your prompts here where you don't have to provide as much, uh, you know, information in your underlying prompt because they must do something in the back end of the structuring in order to, you know, give you more laxed ability so your prompts don't have to be perfect here, but you still get reliable outputs. Over here, you have to be on point and you have to give every single thing you want. And one thing that I found, which is a huge difference between these two that I have changed a lot is the temperature. So if you're not aware of what temperature is in the context of OpenAI's API, just in general, temperature is essentially the creativity barometer that we provide uh, the OpenAI model. So if I have a high temperature or I input like positive two, uh, essentially that means for the model, you can go very creative and your outputs can get like, you know, sporadic. If you go to negative two, this is when, or, you know, point two or negative two, this is when we are like, no, do exactly what we tell you and make sure it is consistent. And what I found is, which is interesting is that the temperature over here in Zapier wasn't too fundamental. You could keep this at a 1.0 and still get very, very reliable outputs. What I found over here though, was the temperature is actually very important. Uh, more important in this kind of structuring than, you know, was I deemed important over here. So, I, you know, it was like really learning the new information. So like having low temperature is actually very fundamental in order to ensure consistent outputs. So what I mean by that, just to give you a little bit more context here, is if I scroll down here, there should be a level here where I'm talking about temperature. Okay, so I found it over here. I went ahead and you have to go a little bit further in the documentation. And as you see here, this is where temperature is found here, where essentially you can even read it yourself. This is pretty key here. And you know, if you're doing temperature, don't do top P. If you're doing top P, don't do temperature. But you know, you can kind of see it. Uh, they don't have it in this example here, but this is the output. But uh, essentially temperature is key in identifying within the prompts that you're using here. You can change your models and stuff of this nature, but that's huge. And, and I found that is way more important than what it was relative to Zapier which as I keep you know, hammering in, it just tells me that something's going on in Zapier's back end that we're not seeing, which is fine. Um, it just tells me that they did some type of proctoring, they did some type of fine tuning where essentially it's actually easier to make prompts in Zapier than it is over here, which is good. As you know, end of the day, it's a front end UI, you wanna make it as easy as possible. But man, communicating directly with the API, you really, there is a bunch of more nuance 
comparative to communicating with it as a front-end ChatGPT or communicating it with as an automation software. That being said, there is the 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 golden goose that laid the egg or the egg, the golden goose laid. You've probably seen that Key and Peel skit. I think you know what I'm talking about or just the saying of the, the, uh, the goose that lays the golden egg, right? That being said, this entire situation here where you're communicating directly with the API and kind of just tying it back to the original premises of this video of prompt engineering as everything I just described there is prompt engineering um, just at different stages. So maybe the chat GPT direct communication is more productivity time. Let me get my answer fast. Let me, you know, let me do something faster. Let me learn faster. Zapier, let me uh, build out a, uh, an automation for my business and use a easier way to communicate to the OpenAI's API and you know some prompt engineering there. The last stage there essentially, of course, is communicating directly within your code and within your backend and using cloud functions and stuff of this nature. But the goose that laid the golden egg is going to be communicating with the API directly. And here's what I have discovered and here is the value. Basically, this is out of all of those, those two are very valuable and at a personal level. At a personal level, slightly business level, because obviously you can communicate it with your business. Communicating with the API directly is valuable tremendously. And, and the reason I say this is because essentially when you build out an artificial artificial intelligence integrated SaaS, the SaaS itself, you know, software as, as a service, I would say around 80% could have already been coded uh, without the AI. What I mean by that essentially is that a lot of the functions that you're doing within your SaaS can can happen and, and essentially you aren't prompting at OpenAI just yet because obviously OpenAI is a huge fundamental part of why it all connects and it glues together, right? But a lot of the, you know, the data passing, a lot of the API calls you make to different softwares, a lot of this is already kind of being done at the Zapier's backend, or not, sorry, not Zapier's backend, but your own backend essentially. And 80% is kind of like I could have done three years ago but the reason I'm even doing it now is because I need that 20% to make it all stick together, right? What I discovered is 80% it can already be done, right? Without uh, prompting OpenAI. And then obviously the other the other 20%, which is that prompting OpenAI, which is basically the glue that makes all of this even work because the whole point of integrating an AI is to manipulate the data, change the data, format the data, whatever it may be, um, is the glue. But that glue is expensive and what i mean by that is obviously if you prompt it yourself it's not that expensive but when a if you were in the future to sell the business if you were in the future or or if a already existing business essentially wants to integrate ai into the platform the most valuable thing about this entire process what makes this stand out and, and makes it to be the gold egg is how you structure those prompts that is where prompt engineering, that value is worth tremendous. Because think of it this way. So let's say I structure these prompts perfectly in this 20%. Because I structured these prompts perfectly in that 20%, essentially, it's software, it's automatic, right? Data communicating with each other. So it's all automatic. You know, once you set it up, you kind of, you could, I could go to Bali and just chill on the beach. That's why software is an amazing market to enter. Once you set up the, the prompts perfectly and the output perfectly and they are consistent and that scale, they're consistent. And, and, and essentially the way you structure those prompts work exactly how you want it to work at scale. That right there is what makes that business a million dollar business because of the fact of the way you structure the prompts. So what that means essentially is that that 80 percent. You could hire a developer for that and have the developer, you know, spend you know, whatever amount it is for the 80% to be coded. That's fine. That's standard. That's just connecting data. No problemo. That 20% is so new. And that 20% of the actual structuring of your open AI API prompts, this right here is your IP. Because this over here, any developer can code out 80% of uh, a SaaS in the sense of Here's the, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Here's the solution that we're going to provide. And essentially, you know, logically, how does this work when you pass data? Okay, you know, connect, 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 connect. This right here, though, not any developer can prompt an open AI prompt. And that's huge. That right there is what takes that. That right there is, is essentially everything when it comes to at least an AI SaaS. And learning that and understanding how to prompt specifically in code when it comes to OpenAI API 
This is where I see prompt engineering to be a very valuable skill because the underlying value that you, so just to give you like a little bit more context here, let's just say we have two major prompts within our uh, SAS. We have one prompt that is dedicated towards the 3.5 model, and we have one prompt that's dedicated towards the four model. And we prompt, uh, we provide a prompt for the 3.5 to do X, Y, Z. We provide a prompt for the four model to do the X, Y, Z. These two work together and give us a nice little output that is the value that we provide to our customer. The underlying prompts to create said value for the underlying customers, let's say for the 3.5, it is a total of six, seven sentences worth some variable inputs from previous data points. And then the GPT-4 maybe is, you know, nine to 10 sentences with some variable inputs. And then both together, when they work together, hand in hand, walking through the park, they create the value that the customer wants. These right here, the actual, you can't quantify the value because the 80% of the work put towards building out the the audit, the SaaS, you can quantify that. You can quantify that by, by um, you know, essentially it's it's been done so much in the past that it isn't necessarily like an unachievable thing. The thing is with this, and obviously as time gets on, people are gonna get better at prompt, prompt structuring, but for right now and years to come, this right here, basically the, the, the glue that makes the AI SaaS works, this is in, invaluable. And essentially, because once you give the prompts, hey, this is the GBT4 prompt we use, here's the 3.5 prompt we use, you are able to achieve consistently this value every single time um, through this prompt structuring. Therefore, you could have 90% of the SAS done, but if you don't know how to prompt an OpenAI's API, you don't have anything. And that's why it's so valuable. I mean, I, don't, I, I can't even put a dollar sign on it because this is where prompt engineering is going to be. This is where the money's made. Um, and I can tell you right now, when businesses uh, start trying to integrate it, and they already are, of course, but just in terms of, let's say a SaaS company is building out a uh, SaaS product and it's integrated with OpenAI, and you know, they're really good at coding, they've built out 90% of the platform, but the problem is, is they can't get that 10%, but that 10% of the OpenAI prompts is so fundamental to their platform that it kind of puts a huge roadblock. Therefore, if you're telling me that basically the only thing stopping from that SaaS company from launching is just getting, is just hiring or paying someone to build out the API prompts that are required to make this function, oh, they'll pay a big, big, big price for that. So, so I kind of want to make this video real quick because it's a lot more nuanced than what I've seen on the internet. And honestly, we're just, this is just a new industry. Um, I just find it super interesting that chat, the way you talk to chat GPT, the way you talk to Zapier, and then the way you talk to it directly within the code, it, they're all different. It's like talking to different people. Um, each one requires, a, you know, maybe different people, but a little bit of different personalities, right? Each one requires a different level of um, experience to know how to proctor each each one. But out of all three of them, of course, ChatGPT provides value in the sense of time and productivity and education. Uh, Zapier, you know, saving you time again, automating stuff and you know, communicating at an easier level. But the, the real one, the one that's gonna send you, you know, hit a home run, it's that, it's that open AI direct communication with the API. That's the little, the actual IP intellectual property value you're creating with the prompts. That right there, that's where the prompt engineering money is gonna be made because those prompts, if you know how to effectively communicate and structure prompts for backends of companies, Oh my gosh. I mean, that's just, that, that's the gold. Make sure to leave a like if you felt value in today's video. I'm going to leave a playlist at the end here where essentially it's more talks like this and quite recently a lot more talks on this topic because it's so new and, and you're really entering a new market. But without further ado, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for tuning in. And yes, surprise, I'm an AI avatar. Make sure to explore more here at Corbin AI, where we demystify AI for your personal and business life. Until next time.